Hi, it's Nick Belkin, a portfolio manager at Ford Asset Management. We've spoken a lot about the late stages of a bull market for the last few years, and now with no end in sight and the market reaching new highs on a daily basis, it's important that we revisit where we are, especially since it's been one of the longest equity bull markets in history. We'll also be dealing with important questions like, will the market stay strong despite what looks like quite lofty valuations? Does Ford's multi-asset fund still have a relatively full allocation to equities? And markets are too complex. Is it even worth trying to understand them? At Ford, we spend most of our time assessing two factors for any investment. We forecast the income stream through time, and then we work out how much to pay for it. Forecasting the future income stream correctly is non-negotiable. It's the chassis upon which we build any investment. Solid, sustainable income streams come in different forms. It could be a growing income stream, like dividends from an equity, or flat, regular cash flows from a bond instrument. Our analysts spend most of their time understanding and forecasting these income streams. The portfolio manager then tries to understand how much to pay for that given investment, putting it against other competing opportunities for that money. We shouldn't gloss over that concept. Our concept of opportunity cost is important and will be covered a little later. That's where MAS comes in. MAS is an acronym that allows us to understand where we are in the market cycle, which is important because markets have very definitive cycles. So understanding them is crucial. So we build frameworks that will assist us in simplifying that complexity, helping us to make sense of the bigger picture and to increase the focus of the key drivers of financial markets. Hopefully it will also be helpful when you need to simplify things when you talk to your investors. The good news is today I have a bit more time to take you through the different bits of MAS. MAS stands for money for the market, interest rates, confidence and earnings. Money for the market, if I start with that, it's a very interesting concept money. I think like any other asset, the price of a good is the balance between the supply and demand for that good or service. In a world of two individuals that each earn $10,000 and a helicopter arrives and suddenly drops a bag of $10,000 to each person, you will not produce additional output as a result. What it will do is lead to higher prices as people have more money with the same amount of goods. In the real world, printing money has added the same thing, which has led to naturally an increase in asset inflation, which hasn't filtered into the real world, but has gone into the equity market and the property market. We don't have to look any further to the GameStop saga to see what so much money can do to markets. So what do we do with this information? We then need to know how many of the investors have their money on the sideline, in other words, in cash, versus how many are feeling more adventurous seeking higher returns in equities. The more money in the market, the more cautious we are as investors and the more cautious we need to be because markets typically have a lot of buyers in the market already in the market if everyone has gone away from cash. Meaning that if the market falls back and people get cautious, there's no marginal buyer to support the market, meaning that there could be a very big dislocation. And with the President Biden coming in and Fed Chairman Powell also acting like a very big dove, watering the magic money tree, you know, that it is a really big issue and it means that money will be sloshing around for a very long time. That means that we're probably going to have front-loaded returns. But in the longer term, there'll be issues as we need to pay that back. What does front-loading returns mean? That just means in a world where we get a standard return of 7 to 8% over time, we might get a lot higher than that in the short term, but we'll get probably lower than that afterwards. It could even go negative. Which makes safety and stock selection and asset allocations key to our future returns. If I turn to the second concept, which is interest rates, A lot of the time, finance people use jargon, like weighted average cost of capital, return on invested capital. But all they ask is, what kind of return do they require to hold an asset? In a world of 1% interest rates, an investor that can receive 4% dividend yield in a quality company is very appealing versus in a world where interest rates are 10%. We would therefore be way more willing to pay a higher price for a 4% yielding company in a 1% world than we would in a 10% interest rate world. That is that concept of opportunity cost or relative opportunity cost that I was speaking about. In a world where the Fed is suppressing the short and long-term rates and prolonging the cycle, it means that we are a little bit more optimistic in the short term given the accommodation. 
But as I mentioned previously, it's just a front loading of returns leading to lower returns in the future. If I turn to the third concept, which is confidence, it's a pretty bifurcated world. If I spoke about confidence pre-COVID, it would have been very high. Post-COVID, obviously, there have been many people that have been impacted, be it the hospitality industry or people that have just been directly impacted. If you haven't been impacted, in fact, the markets have bounced back and people are feeling confident from a wealth point of view, especially in developed markets. So I'd say it's OK confidence, but it's not on the accommodative side or on the, I guess, the opposite end either. Alarm bells usually happen when investors or confidence are at historic highs. This isn't the case currently, as accommodation from money and interest that I spoke about a little bit earlier have been more than enough to offset that lower confidence. When it comes to earnings, as with confidence, without the massive stimulus last year, there would have been an earnings abyss, which would have been very negative for equity markets. How the transfer of wealth from governments to the consumer will ultimately work out, we'll only find out in the future. But we're reaping the returns right now. Long-term earnings are back to pre-COVID levels, but it is a higher base and it is something we're monitoring, which will be, make it harder to generate solid returns from this base. So with most of these factors on the mass side of things, being relatively supportive of markets, we maintain a relatively full allocation to the companies and sectors that we really like in the long term. But that very same, those very same factors that are supporting the markets in the near term are also raising the risks over the long term. As such, we're using protection strategies opportunistically to manage the rising market risks. But most importantly, we're focused on protecting investors' capital by making sure that we're in the right individual stocks. The next few years will be a stock picker's market, which is our bread and butter. The mass framework, which allows us to steer our bigger picture thinking, combined with the asset allocation and stock selection, make us best place to manage the risks coming our way. We hope you found this discussion useful.